recording, you can just go to YouTube and type in um, ECAC Transportation Task Force, Task Group, and uh, you'll get any of the recordings that we did under that name, but also um, because it says ECAC and task group, you may get the other task groups as well. So please feel free to watch some of those sessions. If you're curious what some of the other groups were doing, you're welcome to watch those there as well. Um, so again, thank you all. Uh, if you're having any trouble with your um, connection, please feel free to turn off your video um, and uh, that should help. I know I had trouble yesterday, so I may be on and off, uh, should be fine today, but if not, I might actually turn my video off as well. Um, and also a reminder to please mute your microphone uh, if you're not speaking so that we, we don't pick up any background noise. So uh, my name is Stephanie Chigrello. I'm the sustainability coordinator for the town and my pronouns are she and her. And we'd appreciate if you would use your pronouns when you speak for the first time. Uh, I would just like to start with um, a statement of the indigenous heritage of our land. We humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nonatuck land, acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. Gazikaya. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, so I'm just gonna briefly go over the group agreements that we talked about at our last meeting. Um, and uh, after I'm done going through them, if anyone has something that they'd like to um, change to those agreements or add to them, um, we'll have a chance to look at that. Um, so first and foremost, um, just to remember that um, all of the, topics that we're going to be talking about throughout this process affect real people in their lives and that our focus we really hope will be on um, people's people and relationships rather than on um, making sure that our individual goals are met or that we're winning any sort of um, challenging situation. Um, we really want to be listening to each other and learning and um, focusing on how these topics are going to interact with people's lives. Um, and as a part of taking care of each other, we really want to encourage you to um, take breaks if you need to, to check in with your children or anyone else who may need your attention, to step away to use the restroom or to get a drink or a snack, um, whatever you need. Um, we just encourage you to take care of yourself with that. Um, we're gonna ask that you think about um, speaking slowly and clearly uh, so that we can have a thoughtful pace to the conversation. One way that we're going to um, help remind ourselves about that is to raise your hand before you speak. You can do that by actually holding up your hand if your video is on, or you can use the three buttons to the right of your video um, and just uh, select raise hand, and that'll let us know that you'd like to speak. Um, um, and we're gonna ask that I... you try, sorry? Um, I I don't, I'm Karen Jones, I'm sorry, I may have missed a few minutes. Um, I don't have a screen like that, that lets me put my hand up, so can you Great. guide I was, me? Yeah, I was oh, just going to me. say, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I was just going to say that if you're on a phone, you can select star nine. Okay. And that will also let us know that you'd like to speak. But um, did you say it was Karen? Karen. Karen, yeah, maybe Stephanie, you can change the um, the, the name um, there for Karen uh, so that we can know who we're speaking to. And Karen, if for some reason the raising hand function doesn't work, um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and interrupt just like you just did just now. Thank you. Absolutely. And I'd like to note Thanks, also that uh, Tracy has her hand up. Tracy? Sorry, um, I can wait until you're done, but um, I, I'll just wait until you've like launched the meeting. Did you, are we all good? Oh, um, so my, a couple quite, um, one thing was Eve Vogel had said she couldn't attend today. 
and um, she's in class right now. Also, I had wanted to know, I th I, maybe we just don't have this when we're doing these um, meetings, but like usually there's a chat window or something. And so I was actually gonna say the thing about even the chat window, not disrupt the whole meeting, but I don't see a chat option for this session. We, yeah, we unfortunately do not have chat for this because it's a webinar format. Oh, okay. I mean, you can still have chats, but yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, but I think it also has to do with security. Okay, is there any other questions there? If not, I'll keep going. And just a reminder to um, mute yourself when you're not speaking. That'll help us all to hear more clearly and um, avoid background noise. Okay. There we go. Okay, the other... Um, piece I'm not sure if I actually said or not, so I'm just going to repeat it, is to do your best to avoid any jargon or technical terms um, and just to speak as clearly and simply as you can, um, knowing that we all come to this space with different levels of experience and exposure to this information. Um, the next piece is step up, step back. So if you're a person who tends to talk a lot, um, and share a lot, we're gonna encourage you to do a little bit more intentional listening. And if you're a person who tends to be on the quieter side, we're gonna hope that you um, feel comfortable to share a bit more. And part of that is that we would love to allow for silences um, because that can be an opportunity for people to jump in that might not feel as comfortable if the conversation's going very rapidly. Um, the next one is to remember to keep uh, what we share here confidential and not to pry, not to ask for more personal details or um, information um, and to not, not ask for someone to prove any um, need that they might share. And then the last one is to um, really think about this as an opportunity to learn about each other's per personal and cultural values, um, remembering that our versions of right and wrong are usually a reflection on our cultural values and are likely different from others in the room. Um, so we want to be um, talking about our own experiences and be open to learning by asking questions. Um, and as Stephanie said, we're going to ask you the first time you speak to introduce yourself with your name and pronouns. Um, and also want everyone to be aware that we are recording um, this meeting and it will be made public. So if there's anything that you would rather not share publicly, you can definitely reach out to Stephanie or myself um, to share uh, stories or ideas that you want to contribute, but you want to be kept anonymous. Um, is there anything that I missed, Jim or Stephanie? I'll just add that while the, um, the process is recorded, we're also taking notes. And so even though uh, you may say something, but then the conversation veers another direction, but all those things are, held, are uh, collected in the notes. We don't tag names to the notes, but all of the ideas that come up are saved in the notes. And so we have record of everything. So you don't have to worry about saying something and then, oh, people didn't stick with it. Um, hopefully people will, but we'll get, we get everything into the notes and all of that becomes important part of uh, the process of creating a climate action and adaptation plan. Okay, awesome. So the next piece that I was going to go through is your homework contributions. Thank you so much. I would say this group definitely gave more responses than any other group. So we have a lot of good information. Um, everybody had a lot to say about garbage. Um, as a reminder, our questions were, um, what are the issues with garbage for you? Where does your trash go? Do you have access to recycling um, or composting? who controls these decisions, and what barriers are there to recycling and composting. So I would say that 
um, overwhelmingly what we heard was that those who are living in complexes where the um, garbage and recycling is controlled by a property manager um, or a complex owner, um, there was a lot of uh, negative experiences with um, the trash being very messy, the recycling rules being unclear or not being followed, um, the area being uh, very dirty or having a lot of bugs, um, and that there is no access to uh, compost in, in uh, complexes from what we heard back. Um, and that those decisions are all controlled by the property management, um, and that people would be interested in uh, the option to compost or um, places to store food waste that wouldn't attract bugs or animals. Um, or also um, it came up across the board that a lot of people would be interested in a town composting program that could be available for everyone. Um, Several people uh, across all different living environments said that they had tried composting, but that it was too difficult, that they couldn't keep up with it, or um, it was uh, attracted bugs or animals. Um, some of the homeowners said that they have a very, very straightforward pickup of alternating weeks of trash and recycling, um, and that they're able to do their own composting. Um, and nobody knew where the trash goes that I can tell. Um, there was an idea that it may be very far away um, and that the recycling may go to a facility in Connecticut. Um, let's see, what else? Am I missing anything? Uh, I think that was about it. Those. The, one of the main um, consistent responses with that was that people would be interested in a composting program. So thanks everyone for your responses. And if you hadn't responded yet and you have something to add, please feel free to send it over. We'll definitely add it to the mix. Fantastic. Thank you, Gazika. Any, any questions or comments on that? Yeah, Brenda, you're, you're muted. My question is actually taking a step back um, and let me know if this is not the, the time to do that, but um, I am finding that it would be helpful for me to, to understand. I'm very clear about the kind of the process, but, um, but the, the product, like for me, like to know what the goals are for this meeting and by the end of it, what we, our, our hope to accomplish and then by the end of the third meeting and then and then even like the bigger picture like what and maybe I have missed this but what our charge is as kind of community members and contributing what um, are, are we at the end of this going to come up with uh, real specific contributions I guess like the list that that you're getting now is, is that how it's going to be presented is, is kind of homework each week and then we sent it in. Um, so I guess if that's not appropriate to answer right now, but just kind of like the, the bigger, bigger picture. Thank you. Sounds great. Um, uh, so before we go much further, hi, I'm Jim Newman. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, and um, uh, as, as soon as I sort of launch into our process, I'll go ahead and uh, set the stage for our charge and what we're up to today uh, and uh, kind of a vision of where we're going with this, what the steps are over time. Uh, we are building a climate action adaptation resilience plan for the town of Amherst, essentially. Um, so does anybody else have any questions about the uh, homework or uh, thoughts about that uh, or things that they'd like to say that didn't get said or Great uh, If you do please either provide material to Gazikaya or uh, We can come back to it in a little bit. You can always talk about it um, so 
uh, I'm going to sort of start our process here and just remind us of uh, some of the principles that we that we generated in the last meeting, uh, and then uh, hand it off to uh, Laura and Darcy to talk about some of the the sort of big ideas, the thoughts that we might uh, uh, really look at in this meeting. Our overall process is that we have, uh, we've been sort of defining this, yeah, good point. <laughs> uh, we've been defining this process in, uh, um, uh, so the uh, Energy and Climate Action Committee has been sort of set the charge for uh, with Stephanie and the town and the, the funding for this process set the charge for creating a climate action adaptation plan. Uh, we developed a process of sort of as a team. Uh, when I say we, I mean Stephanie and the Energy and Climate Action Committee and Lauren and myself and Dizzy Kaya uh, work as a team to do all of these things together. Uh, have set a process of creating task groups around four different topics. This is the transportation and uh, non-building infrastructure task group. And within those topics, we'll go ahead and set uh, some principles, which we have done in the last Zoom, although we'll probably come back to some more. Uh, for how we act, we'll set some goals and ideas of actions for what we might do. And then in the final meeting, we'll set some parameters around how we do things, what pathways we might take. Uh, out of that, uh, we'll take this process back, create a draft plan, and essentially come back to all of you to see how does that work? Does that do the job? Does that say what you had to say? As part of that setup, we have set up today for our conversation uh, we have uh, a guest expert, which is actually really exciting. Uh, um, so Sarah Bankert uh, has been working with Healthy Hampshire to look at transportation uh, and transportation needs uh, sort of around the Pioneer Valley and some specific work in Amherst. Uh, I'm going to let Sarah describe what she's, uh, what sort of what the scope of that and the material she's going to talk about today. Um, but this is highly relevant to exactly what we're up to in this, uh, in one of the topics in this task group. So Sarah, would you like to uh, take it on? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Bankert, and um, I go by she, her, they, them. And Jim, when you when you said um, there's an expert here, I was like, I hope he's not talking about me because I don't feel like an expert most of the time. I, I feel like I'm someone who's been involved in public health for a long time and I'm very passionate about it. So that's, that's sort of a, a more comfortable, I guess, title for me. Um, <laughs> um, but I've been asked to come to your meeting today and um, share a little bit of um, past work that I've been involved with in Amherst. Um, doing some assessment around transportation needs, um, particularly in South Amherst and the community of East Hadley Road. Um, so should I um, go ahead and share my screen or do we wanna pause for any questions or anything like that before I proceed? I think you can, uh, you can proceed, although anybody who has a question can either raise your hand or wave uh, uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, sure. I'm happy oh, to Tra entertain. Tracy just, Tracy just raised her hand. Uh, you're, on, you're muted, Tracy. Hi, I'm Tracy and my pronouns are she and hers and her. And um, Sarah, I'm really glad you're here because that's a really important topic. So I look forward to seeing what you have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. One second. Okay. Everyone see? Yes, awesome. Um, okay, so before I get into um, some of the work I've done, I'll just say very briefly 
Um, for some of you um, who are familiar with Healthy Hampshire, you might already know this. I know some of the people in this room were um, collaborator collaborators with. Um, but um, for some of you, um, Healthy Hampshire might be a new organization that you haven't heard of before. So just very briefly, um, we came into existence in 2012 um, when the Massachusetts Department of Public Health um, released um, grants um, to municipalities and regions um, under the Mass in Motion program. And this program was really about trying to get um, local and regional uh, uh, public health and planning departments to work on um, looking at sort of the community level um, issues that are causing people to um, experience barriers around um, access to physical activity and access to healthy food. And so that's sort of how they defined our charge. And so I began working on um, that, this tiny little grant um, back in 2012. And then since then, Healthy Hampshire has grown um, to include a lot of other work, but very related around the areas of healthy food, access, um, health equity. Um, I would say we definitely are, are um, em embedding racial equity um, and undoing white supremacy in a lot of the work we do. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Amherst Mobile Market. Um, that's a, a project that we've supported. Um, and um, yeah, so I don't wanna you know, take too much time, but that's a sort of a, a gist of what we are involved in. Um, there's 15 communities uh, in Hampshire County and the Hill Towns that we um, touch or work in. So, and it's me and another person. So we're, Caitlin Marquis is my colleague. So we're sort of pulled, pulled in a lot of directions and we've done a lot of things. Um, and one of the things that I was telling um, Lauren and Jim about was some assessment work we did about five years ago. Um, around, we were actually asked by the town to do this assessment work, um, specifically um, assessment in East Hadley Road housing complexes around transportation barriers. And then another assessment that I'll talk about a year later, um, uh, that actually we work with Stephanie Ciccarello on, to understand um, primarily the question was whether people in that neighborhood would be interested in gardening at the new Fort River conservation area. And so, um, you know, just a little disclaimer. I mean, the, the data is a little bit um, old. It's five years old. There's many things that have happened, um, particularly around East Hadley Road um, in terms of improvements. And um, this data was in part, um, you know, uh, helped with making the case for some of those improvements. And I would say there's probably things that are still problematic um, that, you know, could be addressed by future work. Um, I will also say just very briefly that um, the way we approach uh, assessment um, it, with Healthy Hampshire is to really include <clears throat> the community as much as we possibly can in that assessment process. So for both of these assessments, um, we actually hired um, young people who lived in those neighborhoods to um, administer the surveys, <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, they actually, we actually trained them on survey administration and they actually went to their neighbors and administered the surveys. And um, at least the one at East Hadley Road is in, was in uh, Portuguese and Spanish. Um, and I don't remember about the Fort River one, but maybe when we look at it, I'll remember. Um, and so also we did a photo documentation project of East Hadley Road with these youth that I can just um, kind of um, highlight really quickly after I, I show you some of the reports. Um, so I'll just pause for a second before I go into a couple of highlights to see if anyone you know, has any questions or anything they wanna. I can't actually see everyone, so I'll be relying on the facilitators to tell me what's going on, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're good. Okay, good. Um, okay, so there's a lot here, and I'm sure these um, can be furnished to all of you, um, so I'm not going to go through everything, but I will just make a couple of highlights. Um, so this is the um, health survey report of East Hadley Road housing complexes. So I'm just going to scroll through here. This is a picture of some of the young people that we worked with, and you'll see some more pictures in a minute. I'm actually going to share with you, um, I'll just share with you the demographics of the people who responded. So 166 people 
were interviewed and these were the apartment complexes that they came from. So primarily South Point and the Boulders and a lot of that actually had to do with permissions granted um, for, uh, for surveying. It's actually, um, well at that time was really hard to get permission to go door to door. Um, so we had to use some interesting tactics to do that. Um, the age distribution um, was, um, you know, fairly, you know, young adult um, centric, I would say. Um, demographics, 60% um, were identified as female, 39% as male, 1% um, other. And then um, we actually, um, when we asked a question about race or ethnicity, we actually allowed people to just write in um, how they identified because I found from previous surveys that that's really important to people. And so you can see just the amazing diversity of, um, you know, identities that people um, self-identify themselves as um, here. And I'm not sure if actually everyone can read this text. Sometimes when I share a screen, it's very tiny. You can, okay, I see Kaisi Kaisa. Great. Okay. Um, so I actually want to just, cause we don't, we don't have a lot of time. So I'm, I'm actually gonna focus on, I think what might still be an issue because we know the sidewalks are being redone on East Headley Road, which is amazing, right? Um, and um, there has been um, some food access um, interventions. The Survival Center has been doing a mobile pantry, as probably some people know, and Healthy Hampshire has worked with community partners, some of whom are in this room right now, worked very hard on getting a, um, a mobile farmer's market set up. Um, so there's a couple of things that have, have happened in the last five years that are significant. There's one thing that I think is hugely significant that has not happened Actually, two things I would say. Um, the, uh, the making a more formal or a safer link between um, East Hadley Road and the bike path, the multi use path, um, and then working on um, bus transportation. Okay, so I'll just, in case people don't know, there's an unofficial path that a lot of people use um, that I assume they are still using from East Hadley Road to the bike path. Um, here is um, a picture of it coming off of East Hadley Road. Um, interestingly enough, when we were actually doing this survey, DCR was redoing the um, rail trail and they actually fenced over um, the entry um, from this unofficial path onto the rail trail. I, I haven't been there recently, but I'm sure some of you have. You've probably seen that it's actually cut, people have cut it down <laughs> more or less. They've cut a hole there. Um, may, but, you know, you can see that there's like this um, steep path already and then the fence went up, which was really an interesting thing for me um, to see that they decided not to formalize that path. Um, you can see um, how often people use the bike path, so just over 10% every day. Some people 15% two to three times a week, um, two to three times a month again at 15% and then about 15% only when I have no other option. So there's a, a fair amount of people who are actually using this. Um, people do use the bike path um, by getting through the cornfield. 70% say yes. And then this is one I really want to focus on, which is, you know, what, um, whether people's usage would go up if um, the path was paved. Now, I've sort of since understood that that's probably not actually possible because there's a number of different legal issues with that um, land and probably people here know a lot more than I do about it. Um, but we wanted to, um, we sort of used the paved um, language, you know, kind of thinking like, hey, is, if this was a safer path in some way, shape or form, like, would you use it more? Um, and so we, we saw that, that that was definitely true for people who are using it every day or two, two to three times a week. can see here when people use the bike path where they go, you know, almost 50% to get exercise, but also we have things like work, to visit family or friends, to get food at the grocery store, to buy things other than food, to go to school. So, you know, a lot of these um, trips are actually, you know, uh, what we, we would call in public health, they're utilitarian. They're, uh, recreation is a wonderful thing, but people are using these transportation options because they have to, it's their transportation to get somewhere, which is not often how we think of bike paths, right? We think of them as primary, primarily for recreational use. 
but um, for people at East Hadley Road, you know, there's a, a lot of people using it for, for need, um, daily need. And you can see, it's interesting here, the question, why don't you use the bike path? The path through the cornfield is too dangerous for almost 25 people, um, which I think is, is a significant number. Before I move on to just show, talk a little bit about buses, um, maybe I'll just pause and see if anyone has any questions or, uh, you know, maybe people here live in that neighborhood and you have some more information than, than I have right now about the problem. Tracy. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I had a few comments, questions. So one thing that's happened since 2015 is that some of the fields that people used to cut through from East Hadley Road to get to the bike path and the mall now are like um, have been, well, not really developed, but they're now set off for um, solar panels. And that so you don't have that same access not that it was great access, but you have even less access now. Um, and that's true, including like if you're trying to cut from the Hampshire Mall, like directly to the bike path. Um, and again, some of that place um, is no longer open. The other thing um, with the bike, well, there's a few things with the bike path um, is one, it's very, very, I've, I've lived near the bike path for a long time. I live about like a quarter mile from the bike path and um, it's very, very dark at night. It isn't plowed during the winter and intentionally, you know, there's always, there's always some cyclists who love to use it in the winter and they'll go and they'll plow it themselves, but DCR doesn't plow it. And there are also people who like to use it for cross country skiing. So there's like that conflict of uses. Um, but the other thing is that there's no lights out there and I've been like stuck on the bike path at night and I know other people and it's literally like pitch black, especially like with the trees in some of the sections. Um, there is now a sidewalk on Route 9 that goes to the mall. So people from East Hadley Road, if you can get over to that sidewalk too, that does provide more year round access to Hampshire Mall and the other places and the people I know who live on East Hadley Road, a lot of them cut through in order to get to the mall, not just like to do biking for, not just to hit the bike path for exercise and stuff, but just utilitarian purposes, because as I'm sure you're going to tell us about like the disconnect with the transit and how you have to go through Amherst Center to get to the mall and that doesn't make any sense. Um, so there is some access now with the new sidewalk that's on Route 9. And that sidewalk was put in two winters ago. Uh, unfortunately, however, that sidewalk is not consistently plowed. And that's been a major issue. And so until that sidewalk existed, you would see like um, pedestrians and people in wheelchairs and so on in the road. And now because uh, the Mass DOT and um, the town of Hadley don't really agree who's responsible it is to plow the, road, plow the new sidewalk, um, that continues to be an issue. So, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Um, uh, Andy, you have had your hand up for a little bit. Uh, just in, um, in regards, I was just trying to look on my phone of exactly this uh, cut through path was, but I couldn't exactly see it. Um, yeah. We had looked at upgrading South Maple Street at one point and providing uh, pedestrian and um, bicycle access via that roadway. I wasn't sure if, the, if these cut through paths are in close proximity there. And that would be something uh, maybe we could look at with the town of Amherst again um, in the future as just kind of more of a question and, and a little background on that. Great, thanks. Uh, Brenda, it looks like you have uh, your hand up. Yep, um, I, I didn't say my pronouns before. Sorry about that. Um, she, her, they. Uh, and one quick comment um, on the bike path and um, what I have seen uh, work well um, is to have one lane plowed. Um, so therefore that could be utilitarian for people that want to bike in the winter and then the other side um, not for skiing. So there, there's this small little plows that can, can do that. And there was people in the past actually shoveled their way to work um, for two miles <laughs> doing that and allowed for there to be kind of a, a, a merge of everyone using the, the path over the winter. So that would be great if DCR could do that. Hmm, thanks.
Uh, Gazikaya, did you uh, raise your hand there? Sorry, I'm looking around to see who else is. Yeah, that's okay. I, I think it's mostly, I was just going to echo that the getting there is really hard in the winter. Um, yeah. Still, and the, that the solar panels have made it more difficult. Right. I just put a map up here so everyone can see the different options that people have from that neighborhood. And again, this is um, five years old, so I don't know if the um, um, if there's been changes. I, I do know the buses still take 40 plus minutes, um, even if the route has changed a bit. Um, but you can see, you know, people do walk um, on Maple Street, um, and that that's treacherous for sure. Um, I don't, I don't live in Amherst and I don't live in Hadley, but the couple of times I'm over there, I always see someone, um, right there by the side of the road, like carrying like four bags. Um, and so if I'm seeing them and I'm not in that neighborhood very much, I can imagine that it, it's pretty regular thing for people. Um, and then this is the cut through, although as people have mentioned, it might have, it's actually probably a bit di uh, different now because of the solar panels. Um, and then the, you know, bus options, um, are, are really, really challenging. And I know um, people maybe in this call know more about conversations that have happened at the town around, um, you know, working with PVTA to do a shuttle bus that kind of goes like this, um, you know, just kind of goes um, down Maple Street and back. Um, and I, I don't know where those are at, but um, that would be, a, a, I think, you know, a potential pilot program that would be really intriguing because the distance to actually get to at least the Hampshire Mall area is so short. Um, to, to potential food options is so short, but the bus ride to get there takes an hour and a half or longer. Um, you know, once you once you do the whole thing. Um, so I think that was those were the major takeaways, and I know you know this is no news to anyone living there. Um, in fact, all of this data came directly from folks and we really appreciated their, um, their input. So I can see Brenda has her hand raised, so I'll, I'll pause. Another quick comment. I'm also in South Amherst, not in the apartment complexes. So a, a shuttle uh, um, would be welcomed. Um, it, it seems to be kind of like a desert in about around the common and the Amherst woods um, and the bus can't come down because of the overpass there. So having, um, I've always thought a smaller kind of shuttle um, that was able to, to run on a, a quicker turnaround um, and that could service that, um, that whole kind of circuit down there. Yeah. Thank you. And I mean, I, I think like, um, although this is five years old, um, as I keep saying, like in our mobile market planning efforts, you know, people just talk so much about transportation that you know, and actually, if, if that was an easy thing to solve, like we'd be working on it right now, but it is quite complicated around working with regional transit um, and also um, the, the path through the, uh, the cornfield crosses over into Hadley and is on um, agricultural land. And so there's, there's actually, my understanding is many layers of, um, of barriers, um, but I think with a uh, um, coalition approach around this work, um, there, there could be possibilities and ways to um, make movement around the transportation issue um, for people in this neighborhood. So um, I'm going to switch over to the Fort River um, survey and just highlight one thing. Before I go over to that, does anyone else want to ask a question or say anything about East Hadley Road? I just wanted to add something that Caitlin shared in another one of our meetings, which was that 26%, I think she said, are um, families or individuals without cars in our little five complexes. So that's very high. Mm -hmm. Darcy, you, uh, you, I've noticed you've been unmuted for a little while. Yeah, I just wondered if, um, if Sarah, you've noticed that there's been any, um, um, much of a change uh, with the the Valley bike share being available to the to um, Hadley Road complexes. That's a really good question and I actually don't have any data personally on that myself. Um, but it's a really good question and I wonder if you know Valley bike themselves might be able to 
um, answer that question in terms of memberships and trips and things like that. Jim, I can jump in. I don't know if you can see me, but I can answer that. Um, it's Stephanie. Uh, and yes, uh, Darcy, we can talk offline. We have data um, and I can share that with you. Great. Tracy has her hand up. Um, I have a comment related to Valley Bike is that it is great that there's the Valley Bike um, station right on East Hadley Road. But one big challenge is that there's no Valley Bike stations in Hadley. Um, because earlier, or earlier in the spring, like the Hadley Select Board like rejected the request of Valley Bike to locate some there. So it is a major issue, not only for East Hadley Road people, but also other people in Amherst or Northampton who would love to, especially Carlos people who would love to be able to bike um, to the malls and so on, but then they can't because there's like no place to park them there without getting charged. Um, so I'm really hoping that that can be resolved um, because that's a big issue. The other thing is that there is a lot of, um, there is an increasing demand in general for bike sharing programs like with COVID because people are taking buses less as buses are both supposed to just be for essential services. So the bus riderships are down significantly. Thanks. Great. Yeah, because you can. I was just going to say to that point that um, the people that I know who can't use the bikes are same reason that you can't park it. So if there was an without paying like every 40 minutes or something like that. So alternatively to getting Hadley to put in um, stops would be to make a more affordable day pass for the bikes um, so that you could actually mm -hmm. take the bike to work and lock it up and then um, bring it back or shopping or whatever you have to do. Stephanie? So there are um, a couple of things. Um, so Hadley, it's not for want of trying. <laughs> We've tried many times to get them to join uh, Valley Bike and it's frustrating for us too because it is such an obvious connection point um, and destination point. So um, there have been conversations about, you know, maybe how we can get around that potentially, but um, we just keep trying to get them on board. So yes, that is a, you know, a challenge for our, for the program. And as far as um, there are discounted passes, and if you go to the Valley Bike um, website now, there's information about that. It's also been in the news recently. So uh, there are some more affordable passes. Um, and, um, you know, that that's kind of a challenge. Again, Hadley not having any stations is kind of a challenge for a lot of people because that is a destination. Um, and of course, if you're coming from East Hadley Road, it doesn't make sense to go back into town to go to a station, you know, to get a bike, you know, and so you don't, you know, have more than your 40 minutes. So, um, you know, we're aware of some of these challenges, but I would just definitely direct people to the discounted passes right now. That's great. Hey, Tracy, let's hold on for just a sec. Thank you. Appreciate it. And um, uh, let's, uh, Sarah, why don't you continue on? We yeah, sure. probably need to keep this rolling a little bit. Okay. I realize I, ha I haven't shown you the photo documentation project, which I'll just touch on really, really fast, um, because I think it can be shared with everyone by email. Um, so you can sort of view it on your own time. Sorry, I'm trying to arrange my screen here. Let's see. Okay. Um, so the young people who were involved in the East Hadley Road survey, um, we also um, worked with them on photo documentation. And so essentially just going around town, um, taking pictures of um, you know, elements of their environment that they kind of felt could be improved. Um, and so I'll just flip through a couple of these. Um, tennis court at South Point. I, I do have to say that I remember now that there was some sensitivity around um, sharing these um, wider, wide, widely because the some, some of the folks um, at the town level were a little nervous about the apartment managers feeling too criticized. So I'll, I'll just, 
I'll just say that and I'll let you all figure out um, how best to utilize these reports. But um, these focus on, on some of the issues at South Point around lack of recreational opportunities, um, lack of basketball hoops. Um, there's some comments about PVTA buses. And you know, if you look at this on your own time, you can actually um, read some of the comments of the youth about the pictures. Um, I'm going to flip down to, um, this was again, accessing the uh, rail trail. Um, some people might know this family, a Vietnamese family with two parents who are blind and they have four children. They now, they now live, I believe, well, they, they moved recently after um, I did this survey with them, but they, so they may, they might leave Olympia Oaks now, I'm not really sure. Um, but I actually watched their entire family navigate this um, fence and they had a dog and two bikes and four kids and the parents were blind and I was like pretty much floored that this was happening in front of my very eyes, I have to say. Um, so there's that. <laughs> Um, here's here's a view towards uh, Maple Street and you can there's a shoulder here but as everyone probably knows it tapers off and then you know this is a typical scene right on Maple Street so this might be East Hadley Road oh this is on East Hadley Road yeah. Um, so yeah those are just some of the pictures of the youth that I wanted to share I'm gonna uh, move to the Fort River survey and just mention a couple of things really quick. So this was done a year later. Um, you know, again, I said um, it was it was youth led in that youth from the neighborhood were employed um, to survey their neighbors. And the 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 real, uh, I think, goal of this was to understand, you know, whether people would want a garden at um, the Fort River farm. And so um, there's just a piece of data in here. Sorry for my scrolling, but I'm just gonna find it. Um, here was the, the response um, of people. Two thirds of respondents reported that they would be interested in, gar interested in gardening at Fort River Farm. Um, and so that was like a very clear indication that this was of interest to people. And I will say, um, we surveyed Colonial Village and Watson Farms, um, and there were, I think, 60 responses. We collected information about what kind of activities they'd be interested in, um, harvesting, volunteering, preparing the soil, weeding and upkeep, of course, is the least interesting of, <laughs> for probably all of us. Um, and then I asked people, you know, what do you need to actually grow food at, um, at this conceptual community garden? Um, and we found that education was definitely a big one. And, um, and then we also asked, uh, like how do we reach out to people about this and kind of build community and get some more input and um, the most popular response was to offer social events such as picnics or barbecues at the site to kind of get people engaged. Um, now we know that might not be possible during COVID but I am very excited um, that I believe um, Healthy Hampshire and the town um, through Stephanie's department are going to collaborate on actually building a garden this year at Fort River Farm and so it was nice to sort of look at this data again because um, it looks like it's actually going to be put to use. Um, and although, you know, some of the people who we surveyed five years ago may not be there, we can um, sort of assume that there's probably still quite a demand for gardening given the fact that people that live at those complexes don't um, have gardening at the complex itself. I think Watson Farms, you know, people are able to garden a little bit in their backyard, but there's no dedicated community garden space in that neighborhood. It is accessible without a car, I would say. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I, I definitely, I know I'm where you have a lot on your agenda. So I'll sort of, um, again, pause or stop and happy to answer questions or follow the lead of the facilitators, however you all want to take this. Sounds great. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Fantastic. Um, why don't you stop sharing your screen and that way we can see everybody a little better. And uh, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so anybody have questions or uh, comments about that uh, portion of the um, uh, of Sarah's um, work and presentation? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. 
Darcy has anything. Uh, Darcy, do you have uh, something? Oh, uh, no, no, What's that was that was a mistake. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Just just asking. I'm trying to be observant. Lauren, what did you just say? No, oh, that was it. Just that Darcy had her hand raised. Ah, great. Um, awesome. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Sarah. Super, uh, super useful. Um, really, uh, it really sets the stage. And I think um, it, uh, it really, uh, it fits right into uh, our art work from last, uh, the last meeting where we developed some principles. And I'm, I'm just going to highlight four of those principles that kind of bubble discussions. Uh, and I'll do this sort of quickly so that we can move on to really looking at some of the, uh, the major actions that, uh, that we want to talk about, which are very much related to uh, the topics we have just been uh, talking about. So the first principle that we developed to do was really to do things together as a community, to build empathy and perspective, to better understand what each other are going through and helping where there is clear need. Uh, and that's something I, we were very uh, attuned to and asking uh, Sarah to help share what some of the needs really are. Uh, the second is um, to build plans and actions based on the needs of those who will be most negatively affected by those plans and actions. Um, I, there's so many examples here uh, that, uh, that are sort of highlight that principle is something that we need to follow that really came out of our discussions uh, last at the last meeting. The third is to prioritize the needs of those who have the least access first. Consider the idea of transit maybe as a fundamental human right. And then the fourth is to connect people to jobs and amenities through equitable transit options that promote public health, especially in areas of low car ownership and high rent or occupancy. So those are, uh, those are principles that have uh, very much related to what we're up to uh, and kind of what we're talking about and what we have been talking about here. Uh, and now uh, I wanna turn it over to uh, Darcy and Laura to introduce uh, the major actions that we were hoping to talk about today. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, my name is Laura Drocker. I use she/her pronouns. Um, I am uh, the chair of the ECAC. So thank you again for joining this group and taking your time. For some of us, this may be one of many Zoom calls of the day. So <laughs> I'm feeling tired myself. Um, although I really found that presentation to be so uh, interesting. So thank you, Sarah. Um, so one of the big, big moves or, or sort of big ideas that we talked about last time and that also feeds really nicely into the conversation, we, the presentation we just got from Sarah was um, sort of how do we think about mobility in a future where we're not using fossil fuels. Um, and so, and how do we do that in a way to the principles that Jim just relayed that is, you know, connecting people that need to be connected to their jobs and th to shopping, um, you know, building the plans that really service those in our community that, that need them the most while also addressing this challenge that we have of moving towards a, a, a future with, with, without fossil fuels. Um, so when you think about the big action of, impl uh, of improving safety and connectivity for alternatives to single occupancy vehicles, um, what we're trying to do is really with, with this whole plan is, is to take that idea and um, come up with specific actions that we can take to do that in a way that sort of abides by all those principles while also meeting our goals that we need to meet to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions for the town, which is the charge of the ECAC. Um, so something I was, so we're gonna talk about this as a group, but just to sort of 
prime the pump, if you will, that there's um, something I was thinking about in, in that presentation was, you know, how do we develop a way to improve safety and connectivity? So potentially if we take the idea that was thrown, thrown out by Brenda of the smaller shuttles and someone else mentioned that as well, you know, how do we make sure those are servicing the uh, area with which we have 26% uh, occupancies without cars and also service the areas where we have people that use single occupancy cars a lot because we need not only to provide transportation to those that don't have it but we also need to convert people that are using single occupancy cars to have adequate accessible um, and useful alternatives so so yeah so I don't know the answer <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're here. Um, but I think that's the, that's sort of the challenge. That's kind of the lens. I think we want to approach, we want to approach all of our actions that we need to, to, to take. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to reduce the amount of transportation that happens with, with fossil fuels to meet our plan. Fantastic. Uh, Darcy, you want to uh, lead yeah. the other and then we'll open up into a general conversation about how we might do those things that we just decide, described. Yeah, we, we um, this uh, working group also is looking at, at the whole issue of waste. And um, so uh, the sort of overarching issue with waste is, you know, getting to zero waste in some way or another. Uh, so that we can reduce our emissions and get to our our climate goal of reducing our emissions by 25% by 2025. That's that's the big goal. Um, but within within that, we have you know a variety of sub goals, and um, some of us have looked at other climate action plans to look at to see what what other communities have been focusing on, and basically. In the waste area, they're focusing on the like the five R's that you've all heard of: the reduce, reuse, recycle, repair, and compost. And so, just to talk a little further about what Gazit Haya was uh, mentioning earlier, one of the one of the um, the actions that's considered the one of the most impactful that we could take is to um, to reduce food scraps um, and by composting. So we'd, we'd have to look at the different uh, ways in which we could do that. So we could compost, do residential composting for residences, which um, right now uh, residences can actually do that. I do it. Uh, every other week, I, USA Recycling picks up my compost, but I have to pay extra for it every month. Um, and um, another person on ECAC, Andra Rose, she um, uses city compost where, and renters can do that too, but it costs $15 a month. So, you know, it's expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, another whole area in which we wanted to compost is with our businesses. And because Amherst is such a big restaurant town, um, we produce massive amounts of food scraps. And restaurants are already required to be doing composting if they produce more than, I think, 500 pounds a week, something like that. Anyway, there's, there's a requirement that they do it. So, you know, we have the challenge of trying to get residents to do it, trying to get um, people who live in the complexes to do it, which, like Gazitaya said, there isn't anything available from USA Recycling for the complexes, um, and getting um, uh, businesses to, to um, you know, use compost compostable takeout containers and so on and so forth. So uh, one of the things that the town could do um, is to um, change their hauler system so that we have curbside composting 
as the default. So then it would be available to everybody, um, including people at the complexes. And there would, there would probably be big containers or maybe even a dumpster um, that would be devoted to compost. So, um, and I just have to say that I, you know, having done it now for about a year myself, it has reduced my trash just dramatically. I basically have no trash left because I put everything either in the recycling or the compost. Um, and because you can put dirty paper, pizza boxes, compostable containers, meat, eggs, all the things that I didn't want to put in my backyard compost. Um, and so it's, it's you know, if we, if we provided it, through our local hauler, then that would that would be one way that it could be available to everybody across the board. So um, that's the big action that we could conceivably take in the waste area that we're going to talk about today. There, there are quite a few other ones too, but that's the one we're talking about today. Great. Thanks, Darcy. Uh, Lauren, do you have something to say? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just yeah. going to add quick. Oh, sorry, not me. Sorry. Sorry, not Laura. <laughs> Lauren. Yeah. <laughs> we'll come back um, to you, Laura. I, I have a few questions and um, I wanted to get some more understanding about the East Heavy Road um, bike path that it was pretty much made because there is no real bike path. So it was made to be more of a direct um, travel to the, the malls in that area. I'm not, I don't really drive myself, so I'm not really familiar, but I'm trying to just give some understanding to myself when I think of like energy and travel and why people may use, you know, different transportation or what they have to do if they don't have particular transportation. My family recently got um, a car. Um, and so the statistic that was mentioned about like 25% of um, renters or people who lived in, um, I guess it was Fort River area, uh, they, they lacked transportation or they lack a car I'm not sure if I got that right but um, I guess what I'm asking is um, those who do not have cars and are seeking to get to wherever they're trying to get to work or shopping areas what what is the what is the the way forward for the town to address that? Like if people are making their own bike path or making a path to these areas, like what do we see as the town or just in our own ideas of what the solution would be? Like, I don't know if that's like preserved land. You said that there's solar, solar, um, panels in the area now. So is it that we're looking to pave, you know, actual bike path in that area? I'm just, you know, I'm not sure if I have all the information, but I'm just trying to understand from that standpoint. Um, Sarah, uh, do you want to, or uh, Stephanie, you want to talk about that? Uh, and as a, uh, just to sort of, as a setup, part of what we're trying to do here today uh, is to understand what we'd like to have happen and what the sort of what kinds of things we're trying to fix. And so those questions are, are right on the money, Lauren, about, well, how does this work and why does that work? And, and trying to get to the, the idea of what is it we need here? Um, so thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, Laura? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Lauren, for that comment. I think um, 
something we could something I was thinking about when Sarah showed the map is that I think we could take the one approach could be to take the existent existence of the dirt path to recognize that there needs to be a path that doesn't mean that the path needs to be there um, and when I looked at the map I happened to notice that there's the golf course and there's a few other places is there ways that we could actually create a path through land that is town owned or um, you know that we could do a public partner private partnership on of some sort so that we can create that path that doesn't necessarily need to be that path that was created yeah exactly it's like what what are the needs what what is it what, how do we do this together what does that look like uh yeah rob You're muted. Uh, you're you're muted. muted. There you go. I just thought, am I now unmuted? Can you hear me now? Now you're good. Great. So, so yes. I just, sorry for coming in so late. I have many other things to do and I, I wanted to get here before five, but now it's after five and I know you started an hour and 20 minutes ago. Uh, Dave Zomek and I and folks who were involved with the um, Norwalk Rail Trail Advisory Committee. So I know somebody from PVPC is here. Uh, is it Paul? Uh, Andy, Andy Um, so was, um, huh, I've forgotten who my colleague is, uh, <laughs> your colleague is down there, uh, Jeff McCullough, All right, Jeff McCullough was one of our staff people in that, but we, we looked um, for, I guess, a couple months, I think we met with uh, one of the, uh, maybe the health director also on the presence of the path and how to try to um, find either a way to get the farmer there to allow the use or to find alternative spaces there. And um, um, if you're aware of how, for example, the University of Massachusetts has dealt with desire lines, places where people have walked over the years, what they tend to do is either finally pave that very desire line, that path, or they put up enormous obstacles at great expense, like buildings and so forth. So I, I'm, I'm very sanguine about, you know, I, I scoped out. I mean, it's sort of in the business of trying to plan paths. I'm the guy who designed the Swift Connector and I was the chair of the committee that re, reconstructed and you know, whatever, the, redesigned the, the rail trail over the last, you know, maybe 15 to, to, between 15 years ago and about uh, uh, five years ago. It was a long process. That there's a, there, there is a way to connect from, um, um, I guess the uh, you know what, what's the what's the what's the road there? It's not Mill Lane. It's the uh, East Hadley Road, up through just to the west of the golf course to the rail trail. But it's not the Desire Line. People don't seem to be walking on it, and it would it would be a detour. It would be you know round trip if you're going to the shopping malls, uh, an extra mile or so. And so we could build it, but would they come? And um, I, yeah, I don't know. D D I don't know if D I mean Stephanie. I don't know if you're still on the line. Yeah, I don't know if you're talking with Dave. I mean, he he and I talked about it some as recently as about a year ago, and um, I'm not aware that there was a lot of interest in turning sort of the very western end of what I think is the um, uh, farm owned by. Um, sorry, I'm again. I'm having name aphasia. The um, they own, they own a shopping sort of building in downtown or Thorn, the Thorns Market, right? It's the owner of the Thorns Market, I believe, of a farm there. It's the western, the western border of that farm with the farms in Hadley, I think, is where there is, in effect, a walking path. But it's, it's not a very direct path, and it may not be so nice for people to walk on if they're trying to get to... Uh, to the malls in Hadley. Might be a nice path to get to Amherst Center. Uh, anyway, just sorry for going on so long. But I'm trying to give you ge geography and, and history all in the same thing there, but it's, uh, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Um, so this brings up the, the uh, principle of working together uh, that we were talking about. So what would it take for uh, pe people to work together to define well, what would work? How does it work? What does it need to have? Uh, how do we 
what matters in this setting? Does going a little bit further along to get a paved path, is that way better? What, something that might be plowed, what? Who would work together to figure that out? Uh, how would uh, members of the town's DPW say, and uh, you know, some of the transportation planners and community members who use the path in multiple ways get together to, to really figure out what's, what, what works for everybody. And then the, the third principle of uh, designing, uh, designing solutions so that the people uh, who are most negatively affected by those solutions have an input into that process. Uh, I think those are, those are key principles within this process we're talking about right now. And thanks for Rob for bringing that up and really, really highlighting that as a, as a thought. Uh, and Lauren, you as well, uh, to put that together. Um, the, uh, so we have a couple of questions that sort of as part of our sort of process of discussing these things, especially the things that, uh, that Laura and Darcy brought up, uh, as well as some of the material that uh, Sarah brought up. And that is, what, what does this action, uh, uh, what needs does this action address and who will be most impacted by it? We're beginning to start on this conversation. What are the different kinds of potential carbon reductions related to this action? I think when we're talking about transportation, they're pretty obvious. Uh, I think when we're talking about garbage and waste, they're probably not as obvious. Um, and then uh, how can this, uh, but, they, but they exist. Uh, and then how can this action be shaped to better serve uh, the needs of the community while reducing carbon? Um, so uh, we have three topics right now. We have topic about uh, the path itself that we're talking about, as well as sort of the general transportation uh, conversation about how best to serve uh, both people who don't have cars and need transportation or need to be able to do things like shopping. We had like the conversation we had last at the last meeting. Uh, and, uh, and to convert people who do drive cars, many of whom have already expressed they really would prefer not to drive their cars if, if it would be possible. Uh, and then uh, the second thing about, well, what's the way to work like how does compost and, and trash, what would be best to work with those? And I know they sound like they're not the same thing, but they're kind of, they're, there's kind of some, some issues here that go together. It's really about infrastructure. It's about how are we serving everybody in the town in different ways with the infrastructure that we all share. Um, so I will stop talking. Um, and uh, does anybody have, yeah, Stephanie. Um, just in terms of how you were framing some of the issues around the path, um, I don't think we need to start from the very beginning of that because there is a conversation that's happened around that path. The health director did meet with Dave Zomack, the assistant town manager slash conservation director. Um, so, you know, I, I know there are conversations, but like a lot of things, if sometimes when you get to a hurdle, there's so much going on and certainly COVID sort of stopped everything in its tracks and shifted focus, um, those conversations got put on hold. So it's, I don't think we have to start from the beginning and I think we should pick up from where we left off. So I think if people are expressing, you know, still that very strongly that desire to make sure that that conversation doesn't fall away, it just needs to be something, one, that we certainly include in a plan, but also that people can reach out um, either through myself, you can reach out to the department, um, you could reach out to Gazikaya to get information to the town or me. Um, there's, you know, pathways if you want to uh, reach out to people um, to do that. So I would encourage you to and know that you don't have to start from the very beginning. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's, that's actually a, a huge uh, comment and to, to think about, especially as we put together plans and thoughts, where do we start to, to start from? Um, so Brenda, I see your hand is up. Uh, before I uh, I'm go to you, I just wanted to ask Penny, 
Uh, oh, Penny, your hand is up. Uh, Penny and Karen haven't said much. Tessa hasn't said much. So Penny. Hi, I'm a she she. <laughs> And um, I was wondering if it was possible that the town could give everybody, you know, those water bins that you have that the rain go into, but maybe they could give everybody a compost for themselves. And then everybody, like, instead of, you know how the trash gives you your trash can? They could all give the, everybody in the town their own composting, um, component and then you do your own composting and um do it that way thanks Fanny. i love that is that something that you could do and you would do yeah if they gave me um a thing to put the compost in and i could get my own like we have tons of um uh, leaves and grass and you mow your lawn and that could go in it too and uh i guess maybe we could try to get hay or I, you know, or worms, mm -hmm. we could do worms. You know, everybody gets some worms and the worms would be eating up the compost and, you know, making good dirt, do it that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, and Those that sort of- ideas. That's, that's, a, that's a, a great sort of, uh, sort of route to uh, part of what Darcy was talking about, about, uh, um, how do we actually get, get change the, 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 the waste and waste is such a fine, change the garbage process. Yeah. And, and also we could have it so that maybe the, um, the, the garbage people or whoever could, we could have a system where the compost people could come and pick up the compost and take it and, um, to where the gardens are. You know, everyone compost all winter long and add your dirt and whatever and your riches to your compost. And then they could all scoop it all up and then people would have good fertilizer for the garden that you want to have at Wild, was it Wildwood? Or Fort River? Yeah. One of the schools, that's all I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, perfect, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Lauren, uh, Go ahead, and then I'm interested in, we haven't heard from Karen. I'm interested if Karen has anything to say, but go ahead, Lauren. I just wanted to make a quick comment about the, the compost. Um, uh, where I live, we do have a community garden and out in the back, we um, have our little um, lawn space. And um, I think it was Darcy who said an idea about like having a big, compost bin or something but I, I would be afraid of that like attracting more bugs or more smells so I don't know if it's better to have like a smaller like individual compost and also I remember um, where I used to live um, in Boston that <laughs> a really good gardener he said that there's you know, there's different kind qualities of compost, and sometimes the compost it will create weeds. So I think you have to think about like if you do a systematic way of collecting um, leftover food or whatever people are throwing in the compost that it doesn't create more of a problem, and that what people are putting on their plants and on their in their gardens is not like contaminated somehow so that's the only thoughts I had about that. Those are those are hugely important to uh, learn um, from what we've seen from other communities that have done composting and large scale that those are those are those are key issues for sure. Um, uh, so uh, who was I missing? Uh, um, oh, and Miss, somebody is out of my view. That's who it was. Uh, Did you say Karen was? Yeah, I have, we haven't heard much from Karen. Karen is unmuted now. Karen, you have, okay. you want to speak? Can you hear me now? Yes. And good. Thank you. I, this is such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for involving me. I've been dealing with all of these issues for decades, and I've, I feel so optimistic hearing what you're doing. 
Um, I just want to say one, a couple of things just to fill in. I'm surprised that people have to pay to have someone take away compost. Compost is such a valuable commodity, so we'll leave that. Um, and I wonder, I want to just say that the folks from South Point and who are walking to the mall, the people who are walking, are making a contribution to the community. I think there are ways in which we need to look at all the things that people do. Uh, they may be compensating for what isn't being done, but I think we start with that recognition. I have a lot more to say, but I just want to commend you all, and I will send some notes another time. Um, okay, feel free to, to go on if you'd like for a little bit, Karen. Uh, okay, if you don't mind. Um, the whole issue of finding a way to provide bicycles to people who want them. There are bikes that are thrown away every day and working, I don't know if the Hampshire Bike Exchange is really the useful partner in this, but there are people who care very much about bikes and are willing to find a new home for them. That's another thing to pursue. And I also, I, I feel that just hearing all the things that have been mentioned, it would be very useful. Um, two things. One, Lauren, I was so glad to hear your comments, and it made me want to support broader dialogue among the comp among the the folks, the different parties who have an interest in a stake in what's going on in in their in their communities. I think it needs to be very personal, building relationships locally, and then identifying what people want to do and how how to proceed. Um, and I, and but uh, the thing that I was going to say that having a, an awareness of the living building movement, which integrates so much of what you're really talking about, um, and I'm willing to. I mean, I want to just jump in and get involved. I, I'm in. I have a long, a long-standing love affair with Amherst. I worked there. Worked for the town uh, with my heart, not with uh, not for money. Um, and I'm I'm grateful for that opportunity. And my investment has not waned. So I think that's that's enough for now. Thank you, Karen. That's a beautiful way of of setting uh, passion as a as a key driver. Um, so Brenda, you raised your hand earlier. Do you want to speak? Yeah. Mm, um, we're not hearing you super I well. I hope you can still hear me. If some of you know, I am. Ah, okay. Hold okay, on. looking good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. As some of you know, I'm camping, so I'm trying to find the best place to be able to <laughs> continue with this, this call. Okay, great. Um, I really appreciated Penny's idea of giving out compost bins to everyone. And, um, and this, um, this is a question kind of, I, I, I'm, my role, I kind of keep doing the, the zooming out and, um, and thinking what Stephanie said about not having to start from scratch. And um, I'm thinking with so many of these things that we are are grappling with, there's so many, you know, cities and towns that that have already put together, you know, climate action plans and bylaws and ordinances. So I'm wondering um, if we have, um, and some of the committees I've been on have done that, but the town recycling committee, we put together a solid waste plan uh, some years back. So that, that exists and something to, to look back at. But just wondering how much, uh, that, uh, if there's a climate action plan that is going to be looked at from other towns um, in developing this whole whole plan um, to look at kind of best practices um, in addition to all the input that that is being provided uh, so that's that's my my that's great apocalypse. thank you Brenda and and uh, the answer is yes absolutely and part of what we're doing here is to understand the both the principles of how we want to act and then the, the ways in which action need to be specific to Amherst, while they, those ideas may be taken from somewhere else, they have to fit our principles and our, 
process. Uh, so that's great. Um, who, um, I was noticing that Tessa has not said anything. Tessa, do you want to speak at this point? Uh, yeah, I'll say something. So um, talking about compost, I guess, I know that I tried to do one at my house, but like my parents didn't really know how to do anything with it because I don't think they ever have either. So I just tried to do it myself, but it didn't end up working that well. But I also know some people in my neighborhood have like a couple group of houses have their own little compost that they've tried to make together, but I just think no one's really informed enough about it. Mm -hmm. So if there was maybe like, I don't know, something on the Amherst Town website or just a whole section for composting or just how to clean up like trash and recycling or just more information on that where people could educate themselves so that they could compost themselves might be a good idea. Or also just like community building through environmental things like that, like composting might be a good idea, or just using the whole community neighborhood building factor of it to help get people involved and interested, I guess, in helping. That's fabulous. Thanks, Tessa. Um, um, Amy, you looked like you had something to say. Do you want to speak? I mean, I, I can. So I'm Amy, she, her pronouns. Um, I don't live in the town of Amherst. Um, I work for the town of Amherst. So I work with the public works department. Um, although I did actually live in the East Hadley Road area for like five years when I was in grad school and when I was a um, young professional. Um, but I mean, I just, um, what Tessa was just saying, I mean, about the education on composting. I mean, I, I'd like to also see just kind of education on recycling. I feel like a lot of people try to do the right thing with recycling, but aren't entirely clear. And sometimes if you put the wrong things in recycling, you can waste an entire batch. And so I, I think that that's just kind of globally, not just in Amherst, but globally, that's something that we everyone can use a little more education or reminder on what's allowed so they can do the right thing intentionally. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Jennifer, so uh, also Darcy and Tracy have their hands up, but Jennifer, you've had your hand up for a little bit and you have not spoken much. Today, imagine that, right? Like, okay. <laughs> so I'm Jennifer and she, her, hers. I'm at work. I work for the town manager's office, but I'm here as a resident. Um, and so I've basically lived in just about every apartment complex from one end of Amherst to the other. So I, um, usually typically can relate to these issues and you know I've gradually made myself uh, come up the um, financial ladder a little bit so but um, I have to say like I think that the composting should be as big as recycling is at some point right like it took a while for everybody to get adjusted to the whole process of recycling. Um, and then compost should now move in that same direction. And I do agree with Amy. I'm still confused about the yogurt containers. I am confused about uh, many things that I get the little weird muffin containers, stuff that you get in packaging. And I just don't know what to do with that. And as many of the people, when I did my homework, and I both agreed that I, what happens when you have single streamline recycling, like who's sorting that? And, you know, I, I'm, I'm in condos now and we have these different barrels, but I think USA comes and picks everything up in one day. So we're over here separating and we're, I, is, and I'm not sure if there's a point. And then we have a lot of students who perhaps don't recycle at all. So I, mm, all right, those are those are yeah big <laughs> and clearly there's as amy said there's there's a uh you know there's a there's a, a clear need for some action around education and around and and sort of the transformative role that these things can play in how our towns work um so uh darcy you had your hand up for a bit yeah, um, just to take off on what Ed Jennifer said, you know, there's a huge issue at the, at the complexes um, about education, about recycling. 
uh, not about composting because it's not available, but about just recycling. And we used to have a, a recycling enforcement person who worked at the complexes, but her grant ran out. So, so that's an issue because that that's very helpful. Um, and, you know, it's just an issue of getting enough money to be able to pay somebody to do that kind of thing. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, uh, Penny's idea about smaller compost containers, the perfect compost container is a five gallon container with a lid. Um, and I've seen that now many times. A lot of people, you know, it, it is available at the transfer station. So if you have a, if you have a sticker, you can take your compost to the transfer station. Of course, that means that you have to buy a sticker. But, um, but yeah, um, you know, my bin is like a 50 gallon bin. I could never fill it up ever if I ever wanted to. I could have like three weddings and still not fill it up. So my, my, uh, my uh, I, I actually did. My, my son is gonna have a wedding and we're gonna fill up the bin. Um, but uh, yeah, my daughter has a five gallon container and she just brings it to me and I put it in my bin. So I could probably do all the neighbors too. If any of you want to put your compost in my bin, you're welcome to. <laughs> really, there's enough room. <laughs> I just wanted I like to it. say one thing that I got off of Amazon and it's a bin about this big and this wide and I put it right next to my sink in the kitchen and I have a compost bags and I just fill it up every time and I just throw it in the trash. So I've been composting that way all summer long. Except that it ends up in the trash, right? Well, it stays in its bag. So I'm hopeful when they, I hear that they go through the trash to oh. take stuff out. No, they don't. Oh, well. <laughs> Good thought. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, but there is a possibility if you're, uh, no matter where you live, you can hire city compost to come and pick up and they just give you a five gallon container like that once a week to come pick it up. And do you put it in a bag, the composting bags? No. You just leave no. it like it is. Directly in your it's a plastic five gallon container. You know, you might want to like spray it out after you dump it. Right. Okay. What I do, I just spray it out. And you put all vegetables, no meat products or anything like that, and just vegetables and stuff like that, right? No, I put everything in. Oh, you put meat? All stuff? food scraps, meat, eggs, bread, yeah, compostable containers. Like if you have takeout containers, can put them in there those things that are uh like they look like they're plastic but they're compostable and, and that that's through what trash place usa recycling i'm gonna call them tomorrow uh if you but it's only that's only residential so they I'm don't buy them. oh yeah. but i live in amherst woods so yeah. Yeah. so you'd you'd be able to get it okay just call fantastic. them fantastic yeah. And that cost fifteen dollars a month. The city compost costs fifteen dollars a month. This costs, um, I think it's eleven okay. additional dollars a month. Okay. Wow. Cool. Cool. Um, so a couple of folks. We got some folks stacked up here. Uh, so Tracy, you uh, raise your hand early, and then Brenda will be come to you, uh, and then uh, Jennifer. Um, hi, so I had a few thoughts. Um, so one thing I was thinking about, somebody had mentioned the transfer station. Um, and I know for a while the transfer station did offer composting. I don't know if they still do. Um, Amy, Amy says yes. Okay, great. And I guess um, a related question with the transfer station is like the cost of the passes keep going up. And um, I think are they, they're now $100. Like for a year, are there is there a subsidized pass option at all? I think so. You know, for low income people. I mean, maybe that there, could be there something. There isn't that, currently. I mean, maybe that could be something the town could explore. The other thing is with the transfer station is, 
if you're a resident and like, for example, you're doing a clean out or something, I don't think they offer like um, passes that aren't for a whole year, right? So that um, like, if you just need like a week pass or something, or I mean, so what happens is if you're doing a clean out and you don't want to pay the hundred dollars, then you end up, I mean, it doesn't end up getting recycled or you know reused or whatever as well as it could. Um, and also right with COVID too, like one reason I go to the transfer station a lot is because of like the free area of like the take it or leave it area. And of course that's closed with COVID. Um, right. On the composting side, I was thinking about partnerships with farmers and other agricultural people. Like for example, you know, there are farming, there are farms that do collect people's compost or leaves or, you know, some people advertise that they want everybody's Christmas trees or whatever. So there are some possibilities there. Um, and maybe there could be some like formalized partnerships, maybe working, you know, with the Agricultural Commission or something. Um, the other thing was that, so, I mean, in Amherst, I mean, I lived in Amherst now 20 years and it's always seemed a little confusing to me that all of the hauling, it's all private. And like on our street, we used to have like three different sets of garbage trucks and recycling trucks that like, come down our street every week. Um, so USA Recycling, USA took over a bunch of the hauling now from Amherst Trucking. And so now they are doing, um, they're doing trash every week by recycling every other week. So they gave everybody giant bins, which my family actually fills it up. Um, but it also is just really energy inefficient. So like, so for example, say 80% of the people on my street, they all have the trash pickup on Mondays. But then people who've moved to the neighborhood at a different time, they have the trash pickup on a different day. You know, and when there were the three haulers, like every hauler would be on basically every street every week. And there's definitely some room for, in terms of like fossil fuel consumption, I would hope that there would be some um, better ways of doing it. <laughs> so, anyway. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks, yeah, Amy. And it, well, and I, I just, I'm more, I mean, I thank you for saying those things, Tracy. Um, you know, I, I will say I'm here to most of the time just listen because, you know, I don't necessarily want to sway conversations with, oh, we, we've talked about this sort of things um, because I think all these ideas are great and a lot of them have been talked about. Um, specifically about the trash hauling, I will say that, you know, um, at Public Works, we're, we're having that conversation a lot because we certainly feel the same way you do about the inefficiency of multiple haulers coming through. And then when USA all of a sudden, you know, when all these things condense down into one company, then, you know, they kind of have a monopoly. And, and initially the private haulers, some of it was, you know, getting local businesses uh, or supporting local businesses. I don't know that that was a driving cause, but I know that that's at least part of the conversation and, and it's no longer a local business. And so, um, I just want to thank you for that. And certainly, you know, we, we welcome those comments in this report because, you know, that would support something that we're in favor of, but, you know, at, at times, you know, at least it's not, it's not moving forward or, the, you know, the conversation, we're just not ready to have that yet. But um, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. And the, the sort of, that's sort of the idea is to forward things. So Brenda, you've been very patient. <laughs> Um, so this is where my passion lies about, you know, getting to zero waste. I'm trying to do it in my own lifestyle. Um, so um, let's see. So recycling is really the last thing to think about doing. As uh, some may know, uh, China is not taking our crap anymore. And so most most of this stuff is going into the trash anyways. Plastic is really not worth anything. And it, it is so confusing. You're never going to figure out like what's recyclable, what's not, because mostly we're not. It's a sad fact, but when you're buying something, it's mostly going into the trash. Um, so the aluminum and the glass, that stuff is still valuable. Um, so putting bans in place and ordinances in place, Northampton just today is putting forth, banning the styrofoam, banning the bags, banning the plastic bags, banning single use plastic. So that's, you know, waving a stick. I guess is how things, how you know things kind of work. So those are, are some really things to consider. Compost, um, as someone mentioned, um, a half a ton a week is banned from going into the landfill from restaurants. I'm sorry, it's at one ton. I think it is. It's going to be dropped in half. Residences, pretty soon, we're running out of places to put yeah, our our stuff. And so pretty soon, we're not going to be allowed to put food scraps into there. So making that yeah, 
easy for everybody to, to do at home. Um, the, uh, the idea about having a monopoly on the haulers, so maybe with the town is gonna, you know, have the contract with them and then therefore determine the contract and say, you gotta compost, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta, you know, have recycling every week and the trash every other week. I mean, what kind of a message is that to say, we're picking up your trash every week, but only recycling every other. So that's, um, and then, you know, all this stuff is being looked at by another committee that I'm on. Um, so that's what I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Thank you Brenda. Yeah, it, was, it was a lot to say. Uh, um, and, and the idea of transforming what we're doing uh, to really like how we live and how the town operates and how other organizations operate uh, into uh, how ways that really don't generate trash uh, or generate trash in a way that gets used by directly by something else. Or, uh, you know, this is, these, these are key thoughts about how to actually move this process forward. And, you know, we want to do it in a way we want to look at these things in ways that actually help people and help your lives to be better and easier. Uh, yeah, because you can. So the one thing I'm going to say is we're sort of aiming to try and go ahead and finish up around six. Uh, so we'll kind of wind it down a little bit. Uh, but that doesn't mean we have to stop right now. Because uh, you can. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure Jennifer had had her hand up as well. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so I don't know enough about composting. I think I watched a family member do it for whatever amount of time when I was like in high school and would go over there where they just had like this pile and everything just kind of went into the pile. Um, but I'm a little bit curious, like if you live on a third floor, how does that work for composting? Um, are, like, do you have little containers that, because I know Penny said that she had like a little bag and a container like can you use one of those I, is rob trying to tell me that you use that <laughs> i think that's what rob is trying to say <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're saying and then as you would take out by, your by the way those bag? are those are also yogurt containers and i mean <laughs> i mean i've got thousands of these the farm is near where i am right now and I, I i bring them up to amherst when i travel back and forth and they're very effective for storing beans and sunflower seeds and you know, if you want a few, I can bring them to you. Because <laughs> I never know what to do with them at the end of the day. Um, so I, and, and so a part of me, I need to learn more about the whole process of composting, but I was just curious how it works for folks who are on, you know, in stacked apartments or on third or fourth floors, because we do have some complexes that have that. And then hmm. um, I think Brenda was commenting, and I get a little frustrated when, I go like to a favorite restaurant in Springfield called the Puerto Rican Bakery and they give me all styrofoam containers, right? And then I have to bring them back here. So it's great like that, but it's like, it has to be more than just Amherst and Northampton, right? Cause I go to Hadley and I get plastic bags from the grocery store there. I end up using for doggy no-nos, but it's still all just a mess, right? Like, every, like there's no consistency when you can go to the next town over and get takeout food and it comes Re regionalize it. Yeah, definitely regionalize it. And bring your, you can bring your own containers sometimes to places too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a short gap measure, yeah. I know, but they load it up in that container so well and the kids don't bother me. <laughs> <and> they... <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I have, a re I have a related comment is I work at UMass and um, so UMass is pretty good about composting and all of their materials are compostable. But what happens is like a lot of people on the UMass campus get takeout from the UMass um, dining services and so on, like the blue wall and everything on campus. And then what they do is that they, you know, they go back to their offices or whatever, and then they want to recycle or they want to compost the materials just like they could if they stayed in the, 
at the blue wall because if you if you check out of the dining services there like there's this whole huge list of like stuff to compost and recycle and everything but what happens is that uh, like all the whole rest of campus um has only recycle bins and they have actually because people try to put the compostable stuff in the recycle bins all the time they actually have these like big signs and most of the recycle bins like do not put your compostable clamshell in here so it's a little discouraging because it's like you start with the materials that could be composted and then there's no system for them. And I do remember, I don't know, a few years ago that there was a compost thing in downtown Amherst, like right near the Starbucks, when it was a Starbucks. Like, I don't, I guess it was just a trial thing. I don't know if we would try that more, you know, as people are eating out, like as people are eating outside at restaurants and stuff more, like if there could be like one or two of those and you could actually hear it like, crushing and compost I don't know, so I don't know. Cool. I'm sorry to interrupt I just wanted sorry. to share that um because we've reached six o'clock um some people are gonna have to start leaving and I I don't want us to have too much more conversation without having everyone present um Penny did apologize she has an obligation with her kiddo um so um yeah just wanted to bear that in mind yeah, so uh, that's that's great. Thank you, Gazika. And so what I was thinking is that we might close with uh, sort of if you have uh, a sort of final comment on uh, sort of the the three different topics that we've been talking about, uh, and uh, uh, and it's something that hasn't been said. Uh, that would be great if you want to make that, and then we'll sort of wrap it up. And you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, yeah, Stephanie. Tim, yeah, I just want to respond to Tracy. Um, mm -hmm. Those units were um, big belly trash compactors, and um, they were something that we were able to purchase with grant funding. We had two of them, uh, and then they broke. And then the company who makes them decided to only rent them. So you couldn't purchase them anymore and they were pretty expensive and uh, because they also had some problems we just didn't think they were um, as effective you know it wasn't necessarily worth paying the money for them um, it might be something that we look into again at some point but uh, at least at the way things stood in the time that we looked at it it didn't really make sense for us to financially do that yeah that makes a lot of sense uh, stephanie um and you know what what I think is interesting in this conversation is that there's so much desire to figure out how to make something make different things work to do composting at a pretty big scale uh, and that's an interesting outcome of this conversation where there's a lot of desire here and and we don't know exactly what the roots are we've tried some Stephanie as Stephanie said we've tried a few other folks have tried a few uh, Okay, we still have the desire is still there, which is fantastic. Yes, yeah, I just want to add that was a trash compactor. It wasn't a composter or a recycling unit. In fact, they had separate recycling units that you could purchase along with the compactor because people were putting the recyclables in the trash compactor. So um, just, you know, it still wasn't necessarily an easy downtown way to deal with compost. Yeah. Um, uh, great. Anybody else? Uh, so Amy, you want to talk and then Rob? Well, and I, I'm going to circle back on the education piece um, and especially what Stephanie said just jogged a memory that um, even the trash cans that we have downtown and some of those are recycles and we do everything we can to label them as such and I'm sure everyone on this call is very diligent about putting recycling in the recycling and trash in the trash but there's others in the community that aren't as diligent or maybe they don't notice the the signs and it's just the most convenient place. Um, but we end up when we do our collection of trash downtown, we end up having to take a lot of the re what was in the recycle bin and putting it in trash and that's always a shame. Um, sometimes we have a one of our workers who is willing to literally pick through um, which isn't quite in her, you know, it's not in her job description and it's pretty gross, but she's willing to do that because she cares that much. Um, but it's, it's also a hard ask. So, you know, I, I more throw it out as, you know, if people have ideas on how to educate or label or do something that makes it more obvious so that people do use these things correctly, because that's all, that's what we all want. Yeah, awesome.
Thanks, Amy. Uh, Rob, you uh, want to jump in? Much as I'd like to continue talking about compost, because uh, I'd make quite a lot of it, and, and it's these these one quart yogurt containers mostly are for other things. But you know, days worth of compost fills two or three of these and goes right out to the compost pile. But but I like to go back to uh, uh, paths and desire lines. So for about thirty years, I've been you know looking at this in the town nearby town throughout the Pioneer Valley, and someone involved in bicycle path planning, walking path planning, whatever. Um, you know, the Swift Connector, the Swift Way was probably the primary one years ago, and that's why it's there. It was a way to connect to the university and the rail trail. And I think the ones that remain that are of high priority, there's one more that's essentially entirely on the UMass campus, but with North Village having possibly a completely different incarnation, it's not clear if that's still gonna be a high priority, but for more than 20 years, connecting North Village, maybe almost 30 years, the university by a walking path, perhaps closer to the Mill River has been a desire line, but the university has been unwilling to, to go there, either for safety reasons or for the investment reasons. And clearly the one that we were talking about earlier that uh, uh, I guess Stephanie pointed out that Dave and I forget, was it Elsie Fetterman or it's one of the Fettermans, I don't know which generation, but we met about five years ago um, when the Re Norwalk Rail Trail Committee was still still active, and we're hoping that um, as the rail trail was complete, find then a nice connection. One, one of the goals of the nonprofit that I'm actually the president of, it's called Norwalk Network, that encompasses actually the entire Commonwealth now, is to try to create connections to the Mass Central Rail Trail, which runs from Boston all the way to Northampton, and the Norwalk Rail Trail is 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 one link in it. And the biggest desire line is clearly that path from East Hadley Road area, cutting across the fields there in, in Hadley, possibly some other route. And I think that is you know, probably now the most desirable new path to try to implement when there's either the willingness of landowners, the funding to do the project, um, you, know, you have to pay something to build these things. And it'd be nice to have input from community that might use it, which would include people like me, just like the bike, just find out what alternatives would be workable. Because if people are going to be cutting across the shortcut on the cornfield, it's probably going to be hard to do as an engineering project. But if, if there's some buy-in from the community that wants to use it to, to take a slight detour, it's a very workable project. I spent a lot of time thinking about it, where to do it, designing it in my mind, designing it on paper. So I hope Stephanie and um, Amy and whoever else is working with DPW and you know, the Conservation Commission and can work with landowners that we can get that going. Because it's, 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 it's been on my radar for nearly 30 years also, that, that desire line. That and the North Village uh, connection to, to UMass are, it seem to be the two most desirable desire lines. Cool. Uh... Andy, Andy. Oh yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of follow up on what somebody else said with this whole regionalization uh, kind of idea of, you know, Amherst has always been pioneers and in, in, in the front runners and, and, you know, new initiatives and things. And, and how do we make these new policies or new programs appeal to the other communities so that, you know, Hadley buys in or Northampton buys in, so you don't have a you know a bike share that has a huge gap in the middle of it. And and I don't know the answer to that. That's what we we try to do is you know come up with these big regional initiatives. So how do we first obviously how does Amherst implement it, and then how do we make it appeal to you know not only your neighbors but more more Western Massachusetts and in that way. So you know air quality does actually improve, or, or our, our movement of waste improves, and obviously our movement of people. Uh, you know, improves and, and, and betters everybody. Yeah, great. Thanks, Andy. Uh, awesome. Um, how are we doing? All right. Oh, Jennifer, jump in. Okay, I'm just going to say one more quick thing. So the Amherst Survival Center at least has a really good attempt at composting, recycling, and trash. I don't know who's been there or not, but I don't it's there. I mean, at least they're, they're making that attempt to, to have it done. And I, so. It's yeah. And 
go and volunteer for the day and see how they do it. I don't know. Yeah, that is a great idea. Uh, that's awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks a ton. Um, so Stephanie, you, uh, yeah, I was just going to very, very quickly say Laura had to, um, jump off because she had yeah, young children who needed her ago. attention. So, um, yeah, and I think other folks are probably needing to wrap up. So, um, we're just at about around the time that we started. <laughs> so it's been, you know, almost a full two hours now. So. Great. Well, I think that's a great uh, call for us to, for us first to say thank you for participating. Uh, and uh, we have a full set of notes um, and you will see some of them. And uh, we will be having our next meeting in about a month. Uh, as soon as we get, a, get the time set, uh, we'll send it out to everybody and make sure it works. Uh, and uh, really, really appreciate uh, everybody's time today and uh, doing homework and all of those things. So thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? No? Good. All right. Thanks a ton. Thank you, everybody.